what they had to do was retarget the missile. There was no damage to any of the hardware. I want to emphasize that the UFOs did not damage anything. Welcome back. I'm here with Bob Salas to talk about the Malmstrom incident. Bob, welcome. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And it's timely too, kind of given what's going on with Arrow. So I'm going to do two things. The, the first is for folks who've heard this story, you're going to hear it again, but you're going to hear it as if I'm on Arrow and I'm asking the questions that Arrow should have asked. <laughs> and <laughs> which is pretty arrogant of me, but I, I, I'm doing it to have fun. I'm not, I'm not doing it to shame anybody or, or to be arrogant, but I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to, Bob's told this story a billion times. So hopefully it makes it fun for him too. The second thing we're going to do in the, in the next episode is we're going to talk about the actual interview that he had with Arrow. So with that, Bob, tell me a little bit about your background, how you got into working on a nuclear missile flight. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I'm a graduate of the Air Force Academy in 1964. And my second assignment was to become a missile launch officer. So I went through the training. It was about a year of training. And so we, we knew the, the missile systems pretty well, uh, at least the Minuteman 1. I got to Malmstrom in August of 1966. Mm -hmm. And then active missile launch officer, I think it was October of 66. And I was on duty with Colonel Fred Mywald. He was a lieutenant like I was at the time. But, uh, we were a two-man crew as of October of 66. And then again, we were on duty as a crew on March 24th, 67, when the incident happened. Now, when the incident happened, were you a first lieutenant, second lieutenant? I was a first lieutenant. We were both first lieutenants. He was the what we call a missile combat crew commander. I was the deputy missile combat crew commander. So there were just two of us in the capsule. And it was an underground capsule, as you know, about 60 feet underground. And we had responsibility for launching 10 missiles if we got the call. So. And those missiles were the Minuteman 1 missile. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And how long had the Minuteman 1 missile been in operation? Yeah, it became operational in October of 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, actually. Yeah, that's when it became operational. And that was our, our main nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile at the time. Of course, we had the Titan II. It was probably still active at that time. The Atlas, I think, had been decommissioned by then, so that was the situation. <laughs> wasn't that wasn't there a Titan II involved in the Damascus incident, like long after your time, but at, at uh, Little Rock Air Force Base in the nineteen eighties? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, well, I'll just really quick for the the audience, they were working on a missile silo, and on Little Rock Air Force Base or nearby, and one of the technicians dropped a socket wrench or something like that into the chamber and the thing either got launched or got like pushed a hundred feet or something like that. You know, obviously it didn't <laughs> detonate, but it was wow. not good. It was not good. And the only reason I know that is my uncle was in the air force. And I think we visited little rock like a year after that happened. And I, I had no idea it happened. I don't think my family had any idea that happened. I mean, my uncle certainly would have known it happened, but he didn't get to that post until after. But anyway, neither here nor there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the Minuteman 1, was it a multiple independent reentry vehicle yet, or was it just a single warhead? I don't think it was multiple reentry vehicles at that time. I'm almost certain it wasn't. As far as I'm concerned, we had a single warhead. And 
I'm not telling any secrets here because the warhead capability was 800 kilotons, as uh, reported by the uh, Bolton of Atomic Scientists. Mm -hmm. So I'll just quote them. <laughs> but it was 800 kilotons. And then in relative to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were they one uh, kiloton, something like that? There were 20, about 20, 20 kilotons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this was 40 times. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then were the targets fixed or were they constantly changed? I can't talk about targets. Uh, okay. That's one of the things that was very highly classified. Yeah, I, I told you. That's why I asked you at the beginning. I knew I knew I'd quickly get this. Okay. So you can't you can't talk about target designation. I completely no. understand. Okay. So in terms of what your role was, you were the deputy of this missile flight. There's 10 nuclear missiles in this flight mm -hmm. and you're 60 feet underground if you got the orders to launch what was the procedure for that high level like was it did there have to be several different people way above you who made that decision and then you just got the orders you had some sort of confirmation code just very basically for the audience. Yeah, we you could uh, describe that. The order came down, of course, starting with the president. The president would have to initiate the order, and then there was a chain of command. Of course, we were under strategic air command at the time, and we would get a encoded message, and we had a, a way of decoding the message. And if it checked out, we would go ahead with our launch procedures, which were and, pretty rapid. It didn't require much time at all. And once that thing goes goes out the tube, you can't. There's no way of disabling it or recalling <laughs> it. I'm assuming. Yeah, we, we can't recall it. No, no. Okay. And you can't remotely detonate it. Like this is the 1960s. They don't have that kind of. No. Okay. No. And then, how often did you have drills? where I'm sure you know it's a drill, given the, the gravity of it, I hope. But maybe well, you didn't. We, I don't know. We didn't have drills. You know, you, you mean launch drills where we would uh, do a mock launch? No, we didn't do that. The launch procedure was pretty straightforward. It involved arming the missile and then turning keys. We each had a, a key to turn, and that was about it. So, no, we didn't need any practice for that. We did from time to time go to Vandenberg and fire one of the missiles mm -hmm. that have been around for a while just to do a live launch from Vandenberg. But again, this these were mock warheads. Yeah, it's like a ballistics test. You just want to make sure that the rocket gets to its target. You don't need a nuclear warhead to do that. Right. Okay. All right. So... The deputy commander and commander, are you working on shifts or are you both always on at the same time? We had rest periods. So usually in the evening after dinner, one of us would take a four or five hour nap and then the other one would take another four or five hour nap, something like that. I don't recall exactly. But yeah, when I was speaking to the guards upstairs, my commander was on a rest break or a nap break. Yeah. Okay. Now, in order to get into this program, I'm assuming that it's an extremely robust psychological profile and things like that that you have to go through, correct? Well, I don't know how robust that we did have to qualify, of course, and we had standard standboard tests, what we call them, standboard standard testing on a regular basis to remain qualified. Other than that, I'm not sure what other in-depth qualifications we had to go through on a regular basis as far as our mental health goes <laughs> i don't recall ever going through any mental health tests after we were you know selected and went through the program okay but the selection process involves some sort of profile yeah, yeah. okay okay all right so you're underground 60 feet in terms of the overall unit, you had a missile flight, each missile flight, and this is Oscar flight, is that correct? Right, right. 
Okay, so you're in charge of, or jointly in charge of 10 missiles. Mm-hmm. How many other flights are on this installation or in your unit? And I'm assuming each consists of 10 missiles. All right, so we had a total of 15 flights of 10 missiles at Malmstrom at the time. More flights would come on later, I think. But at the time, we had a total of 150 missiles on the alert status at all times. Then we had three squadrons. We had the 490th, which I was a part of, and then the 10th and the 12th squadrons. And so those squadrons would divvy up five of the flights. So and how had... many? Go ahead. How many personnel were in a typical missile flight and kind of what roughly would their job or their duties be, their roles and responsibilities? So for our our flight at Oscar, well, any of the flights really, we had usually six guards upstairs, security guards. We had what called a flight security controller that managed to supervise those guards and then Myself and my commander were basically the command crew. You know, anytime we went on alert, we would be in command of the facility. They had no way of affecting the missile systems from upstairs. Uh, We had all Mm -hmm. the controls downstairs. They couldn't have perpetrated some kind of a hoax or anything like that. Now... Again, I'm just speculating. Let's say that security team goes rogue. Were you armed inside the? Well, they couldn't get in. We were locked in with a huge door, but we were armed, mainly for self-protection from each other, I guess. But if, if someone was able to get in, let's say they overrode the security procedures and got in, yeah, we had weapons and we were armed. Okay. All right. In terms of like technicians, maintenance and things like that, I'm assuming the squadrons were in charge of that, you know, a higher squadron level. We had a separate maintenance squadron. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the security people had a separate squadron of of security and maintenance people were separate from the operational, uh, from us who were, in charge of the missiles. Now, what about radiation monitoring? Is it the background radiation of the area was typically the same, or were there ever times when there's no, some the, elevation? Well, if you're worried about uh, the uh, radiation leakage from the actual bomb, or well, well two 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 I, things. The reason I'm asking the question is one to establish if there could have been any radiation leak or contamination, and then to establish whether or not there was any residual radiation from the incident and whether or not they could uh, be related. You know, I, I think if anybody had to worry about radiation, it would have been the maintenance people that went out there and uh, did maintenance on these uh, on a regular basis. But these weapons, the nuclear weapons, were pretty sturdy, self-contained. I don't think they had to worry about radiation leaks. But I never okay. had any issue with that, of course, unless there was an accident. And I think one did happen. Well, we had these big trucks that would carry the missiles out there. And I think one of them went off the road one time and they had to be concerned about the potential of the warhead being damaged enough to leak, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, so to your knowledge, there wasn't necessarily a procedure where they would just do a no. scan of the base to check residual radiation levels. No. Okay. Okay. All right. So, talk me through the night of the incident, the okay. date, all that, all that good stuff. Yeah. So it happened on March twenty fourth, and I'll tell you later how we were able to confirm that date. But I was the one who was on alert status or on duty. And I get a call from my topside guard telling me that there's lights flying over 
the facility. He described them as lights. And, he said, and, and what, is there like a there's like a telephone, like a wired telephone? And you get a call. Uh, yeah, on that. yeah, yeah. This okay. was a regular telephone, but it was directly connected to the capsule. But we also had VHF and HF radios. But this was a phone call. He said they were flying very fast, stopping on a dime. This literally, as far as I can remember, it, exactly what he said. They were flying extremely fast, stopping on a dime, reversing course, making 90 degree turns. And he said, sir, they are not aircraft. They are not airplanes. <laughs> There's no way. And, and, and who was this? Can you say this person's name and rank? No, I can't. I, I, I okay. forgot. It. I, I would if I remembered it, but <laughs> it's been so long. I, but what was the title? What was his title? Just the uh... flight security controller. Okay. He's the guy who's in charge of the six security people. Exactly. He's the guy who's okay. in charge of the security top side. Yeah. He said no engine noise. They were not aircraft. And I even said, you mean like UFOs? Because we'd had UFO reports in the city of Great Falls in the newspaper all that week and at other times. But I've got copies of those newspaper reports. Anyway, he didn't say, yeah, like he said, <laughs> basically, they're not aircraft, sir. He repeated himself. Well, you said it sarcastically, like, like what? Like I UFOs? said it sarcastically, but... He was serious. He said, yeah. they are not aircraft. He kept repeating it. I said, okay, well, thank you, Sergeant, and basically hung up on him. I didn't think much of it. You know, he was reporting lights in the sky. He could have been pulling my leg for all I know. That right. I, it could just I, be a I, test, right? Just to yeah, just, have just, a laugh. But they didn't usually do that. The, our conversations were pretty professional. You know, we were in charge of 10 nuclear weapons, we, we we didn't usually joke around like that. And then about five minutes later or so, he calls back, and this time he's really frightened. You can tell by his voice. He's uh, screaming into the phone. He's babbling, shouting, scared to death. I calmed him down, said, what's going on? He said, there's a glowing red-orange light hovering just outside the front gate. Got all the men out with their weapons drawn. What should I do, sir? So, of course, I was kind of shocked. I didn't expect a call like that. But this time, I, I took him very seriously. I thought we were under some sort of, possibly some, under some sort of an attack. I said, make sure secure the fenced area, you know, do whatever you have to to secure it. And they said, I, I got to go, sir. One of the guards got injured and he hung up the phone. So next thing I did is I woke up my commander. I was taking a break. It's Fred Mywald. And started to tell him about the phone calls, but before I could really talk to him, we got klaxons going off and horns, horns, which we knew what that meant. We looked over at the status board that we had, and the missiles were going down. We were going from green to red or no go. Now, when they go down, what does that mean? Does that mean the warhead's inactive, or that the rocket motor is inactive, or can well, it mean any number of things? Unlaunchable. The light itself means that they can't be launched. But we did have what's called the Versa. You get what the Versa stands for, but it was a way of querying each of the sites, each of the launch facilities. By the way, our launch facilities are about a mile or, or more away from the, the launch control center where we were. So where uh, are the guards? Do the guards patrol the, the silos the guards, or do they patrol uh, your base? Well, right now they were upstairs. We knew when they went out, we'd only send them out if we had incursion lights. We had one of the lights we had on our board was if something intruded into the launch facilities, which is where the missiles are actually located. Okay, so the UFO, 
these objects showed up in the control facility, but not in the launch facility. Well, let me finish. Yeah. So we went through our procedures and of course, one of the things my commander did was call the base, call the command post, really, and report the missiles going down. But there were also incursion lights at two of the launch facilities. So I called upstairs first to check on what was going on. He said the UFO or object had just blown off. But then I had to order them out to two of the facilities. So he sent guards out to two of the facilities. And again, they saw UFOs hovering over each of those facilities. So we just had them come back. We didn't have them go in and check things out because the missiles were down anyway. So we just had them come back. So quick question on that. The Mm -hmm. missiles became inoperable before there was an incursion on the launch facilities? Well, you know, we were busy with trying to interrogate the system. Like I said, we had a a way of interrogating each of the launch facilities. They, They had all gone down. I don't know when exactly those incursion lights went on, but by the time we were going through our checklist, we looked over and yeah, we had incursion lights at two of the sites. So we had to send guards out there. This was confirmed by by my commander. And then the other thing that happened was after his phone call with command post, he turned to me and said, the same thing happened at another flight. And I thought that was the echo flight incident. But I thought he meant that evening at the time. But Later on, of course, after I started going public and researching this, I found out that Echo Flight went down eight days earlier under similar circumstances. Now, in terms of the sensors that you would have used to detect incursions in the launch facilities, are they ground sensors? Are they directed upward? Is it kind of a panoply of different sensors? In other words, would they have been able to detect an aerial object? Good question. <laughs> they, oh, this is this is these are the questions Arrow should have asked you, to be frank, right? Yes. I don't know how high uh, they would have detected any incursion. They were intended really to check more ground level. I know we got incursions from jackrabbits at times jumping the fence. So probably at least as high as the fence anyway around the facility that sounds more more kind of seismic yeah 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 okay so again these are lights we don't know what the lights are could they have been orbs or did some of your security team detect like a metallic object well or see not detect the flight security controller described to me what he was looking at He said it was basically a very bright red-orange light. The light would be pulsating at times. And I asked him to see if there was anything. I remember specifically asking him to see if there was anything inside the light that looked like an object. And he said there was something that looked like an oval-shaped object inside the light. However, it was very difficult for him to see any detail other than this shape. So that's the best I can do as far as answering your questions, whether they were orbs or not. This was more of an elliptical shape, oblong like shape. A, like a dull shaped or like ovoid, like egg shaped? Yeah, more like egg shaped, I'd say. But that's the best he could do. Right. The light was so bright, it was uh, difficult for him to determine what the shape looked like. Okay. All right, so the intrusion sensors, which, again, we don't know for sure, but it seems like they're seismically triggered. Why something would be seismically triggered by something in the air either implies that there's some force acting upon it that 
you know, sound, vibrational, acoustic, or I don't know something. Something went. Oh, sorry. It it could have been some kind of a radio signal. I don't remember the details, but yeah. I mean, that's a good question to ask the Air Force, for example. Well, the Uh, Air Force would have all this data, right? uh, So they would have the details on how these incursion sensors worked but all i know is we had the ability to monitor remotely the sites with sensors to determine if anything had you know broken in or entered that fenced area but the guards did report seeing ufos above those sites when they approached them they saw those lights Okay, so an alternative theory could be that maybe you use seismic, maybe you use electromagnetic, maybe you use both. But if it were electromagnetic and you have an electromagnetic, you know, something giving off or emitting radio waves and some sort of electromagnetic radiation, that may have set it off without having somebody actually physically present. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, for a moment, I'm thinking... <laughs> You know, maybe something, maybe something went down there, but there's no evidence to suggest either way. Well, not in that case, but there was another case in '68. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Again, I was Minot. I'm, I'm definitely not. Definitely not. Minot Air Force Base, 1968. It's a very well documented case. Major Bradford Runyon uh, is a primary witness. He's still living, by the way. Anyway, uh, B-52 co-pilot. And they encountered UFO in the air, are you at? And the entire crew saw them. It was seen on radar, airborne radar, and it's, I think, ground radar. But they were coming in to land from a training mission, and they were told to not land by this general officer on the base and fly over one of the launch facilities because there was an object that had landed apparently right next to one of the launch facilities and later when this crew b-52 crew landed they were debriefed by this general officer and told that the fencing was crushed and that this 20 ton lid that we had covering the launch tube weighed 20 tons had been literally lifted and put to one side so now (laughs) like i said this is very well documented by tom tulian i don't know if you've heard of tom tulian but he did a complete interview of many of the crew members including radford running fascinating okay so going back to what's going on the night how many of those 10 missiles went inoperable all 10 Okay, so these things go off, the klaxons go off. So you mentioned an airman was injured. Right. What happened there? Well, as far as we can determine, it, he cut his hand, and there were two stories I heard because he, he did have to be helicoptered back to base because the gash was pretty good gash. And we're not sure whether or not he tried to climb the fence, which had barbed wire around the fence, or his weapon jammed somehow and he got his hand got caught in it, something. But he did have to be helicoptered back to the base. Now, I got confirmation of that fact that one of the guards was injured by a man who was on security details at Malmstrom at the time. And they all lived in the same barracks. And he heard uh, the story about this guy getting injured during our incident. So I've got that in writing from this other fellow. So I got it two ways, one from the guard security controller and from another airman. But it was not due to the UFO firing a a weapon at him or anything like that. Now, the, the UFOs hovering over these guards, how long is it there? What does it do? 
does it leave shortly thereafter or is it there for a while? Well, you know, our procedures, uh, we went through our checklist pretty quickly. I would say a minute max. It was probably there for a minute or so. But when I called back up, you know, after we, we went through our checklist procedures and we went through it fairly quickly, the FSC said it just flown off. Okay. Oh, sorry. The FSC is the flight security controller, right? Controller. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Interesting. Okay. So after all that happens, you have all of these inoperable nuclear missiles. <laughs> What does what your commander do at that point? Well, like I said, we went through a checklist. He called the command post, and they said we're going to send out crews, maintenance crews out there to restart the missiles. The indication we got from our Versa, which was a readout, said that it was guidance and control system failure. What they had to do was retarget the missile. There was no damage to any of the hardware. I want to emphasize that the UFOs did not damage anything. All they did was upset. We had an inertial guidance system, which required a level platform for the gyroscopes, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have GPS at the time. So it was all determined on calculating it's like analog, analog. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you knew your speed and your orientation, your X, et cetera. So they, they basically had to go back and reset the, the whole system because it, all it was was an upset of this level platform. At, at the time, I don't think there was, but I could be wrong. At the time, was there any solid state electronics inside the missile or was it still, you're still on an analog system? Uh, well, by solid state, you mean transistors and that sort of thing. Yeah, as opposed to like analog computers, mm-hmm. like capacitors and inductors and like we old school. Had, we might have had transistors, but I don't think we had any. It wasn't digital for sure. It was mostly analog. Yeah, so there was a particular piece of hardware called a, a logic coupler mm-hmm. that Boeing did a bench test on. Later on, we found this out from some of the documents we got back. And real quick, what does a logic coupler do? Well, it's a look at it as a way to integrate the data that we're getting after launch from accelerometers and the gyros, a three axis data. And it takes that data and calculates basically what the position of the missile is with respect to the target so it's kind of so it's it's like it's like a logic circuit yeah a logic circuit yeah okay anyway they were able to upset the logic circuitry or the logic coupler on the bench by injecting it with a particular voltage and frequency and time so we have that data that information but so were, so it was like it was like an i mean was it em pulse or was it not em pulse it was just a specific electromagnetic magnetic pulse yeah. or sorry oh, signal sorry i'm getting whatever you want to call it signal signal is probably a better term because yeah. em pulse implies yeah. nuclear and so it's almost as if there's a frequency at which the signals were pulsing through the the logic device and they could have sent an equal and opposite Mm -hmm. frequency that was like uh nullified the wave or yeah i i don't know the details but i do know i i I do have let's say the details of the type of pulse that boeing used to upset the logic coupler or disable the logic coupler from a bench test they actually did that. And so they suggested to the Air Force that this could have been the cause. But they also said this would have to have been an, from an external source. 
It was nothing that was created by any of the systems internally. So what we're talking about is uh, this UFO or object had to have sent this signal, we'll call it, through 60 feet of earth and concrete, and then penetrate triply shielded cable, about a nine inch diameter cable, triply shielded against EMI, and then send that signal directly to this piece of hardware called the logic coupler. And that it would have had to do that to each of the missiles separately because we had separate cable systems and within seconds of each other. So, because all the missiles went down within seconds. Interesting. The imagination goes in a variety of different ways in terms of trying to figure out, like, could they have sent, I don't know, I, <laughs> could they have sent machines into the, the barrel into the ground that, you know, pulse it, or do they just have a technology that's so far beyond, I say they, but I, I have no idea what these things are, right? They could be, I don't, they, you know, they could be machines, they could be any number of things. I, you know, I know for damn sure they ain't Chinese or Russian, which is kind of the kind of like, and by the way, why the government would use that as an explanation for some of these technologies is horrifying, right? I'd rather it be some, you know, alien species somewhere, you know, millions of miles away than the Russians or Chinese, but <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Okay. So, so after this incident happens, does the OSI pay you a visit? No, we were ordered, to, after we were relieved by another crew, we were ordered to go see our squadron commander. He got, no, he, he was an old B-17 pilot from World War II. He'd flown many missions in World War II. And when we walk into his office, he's white as a sheet. I mean, he, he could, I, I asked him directly. Wait, he, he, he flew a B-17, which basically had... Right. Probably among the, the among the highest casualty rates right. of the war, because they were, you know, he had McNamara, you know, in his little office of whatever, telling him to fly lower and lower and lower because they're getting better aiming not, circles, right? Not McNamara, but what was that other guy's name? You're uh, through Curtis LeMay. Yeah, Curtis LeMay. So McNamara, you know, what obviously wasn't the sec Secretary of Defense, but he ran this office at Harvard. Where they were computing. Oh, oh maybe you know during, more than I do on, on that. During the war, they were computing the like time on target and things like that. So the thing that was driving LeMay with the data to support getting closer and closer to the target was mm -hmm. McNamara's little you know whiz kid organization back at he. Okay. I mean, this is the this is the invention of operations research. This okay. is where it came from. So okay. yeah, so yeah, McNamara, yeah, you can blame Mac. So yeah, so this guy survived all that and he, the fact that he exactly. would be white is horrifying I, I, swear to god, I swear to god he you know i knew this guy I, this uh, squadron commander we, you know we had drinks in the officers club all the time together i i knew him very well and so i i didn't stand on any uh you know yes or no sir it was i walked up to him and said was this some kind of an air force exercise and he said absolutely not and then there was another guy from AFOSI in the room, and basically they didn't even want to hear our side of the story. <laughs> All he did was shove a piece of paper at us, said, sign here. I said, what's this? He said, that's a non-disclosure agreement. You're never, ever to talk about this, or you're going to spend a lot of time in Leavenworth Prison. And that was specified, actually, in the NDA. I remember reading that part of it, Leavenworth Prison. Yep. It might have been uh, after your time, but they had us take a linguistics test when I was an officer where it was an invented language, right? It was a to test what your capability was for defense language aptitude. It was a defense language aptitude test. Mm -hmm. And at the very beginning, we had a briefing. And in the briefing, it said, if you disclose any of the details of this test, you could do up to 20 years of hard labor at, and they, they use the words hard labor. Like I'm, 
<laughs> exactly. No, I remember they said something. It said something like that. Uh, Twenty or thirty years. In Leavenworth Prison specifically, they said Leavenworth Prison. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember for us if it, it was specifically Leavenworth, but it was specifically twenty years hard labor. I remember that. That's the part that stuck with me. Yep, yep, yep. It's okay, so you scare the hell out of me. Yep. So yeah. you sign this document. Yep. And does anything happen after that? Does it impact your career? Does it? Or was it just kind of forgotten uh, about? Or first of all, nobody ever talked to us after that day about this incident, even though we knew there was some sort of uh, investigation going on about exactly what happened. And uh, as crews, as combat crews, we were supposed to be informed as to what the status of any mods or anything going on with the weapons and. We were briefed regularly before we went on alert, and nothing. We heard nothing about either the Echo or the Oscar flight shutdown, and that's because of the ongoing Condon investigation. Condon investigation started in 66, ended 68, late 68, early 69. And was this the investigation where the conclusions were kind of preordained, like you will? You yes, will... yes. They were preordained. I've even got records showing that. So the timing of this particular incident is uncanny. It's critical, yeah. So the Air Force didn't want, or yeah, they didn't want the Condon investigators to get wind of this, but in fact, they did. The chief investigator, a guy named Roy Craig, of Condon investigator was contacted by Ray Fowler. I don't know if you know that name, but Fowler... Name sounds familiar. Yeah, he, he's, he's written some books, but at the time, Fowler was in charge of managing a contract for electrical systems on the Minuteman, and he had people at Malmstrom that were working for him that got wind of the shutdowns, the Echo and Oscar shutdowns, and actually, one of them had actually seen the object. I don't know which time, but anyway, Fowler got reports that the, these incidents were due to UFO activity. And so he contacted the Condon investigator. The investigator went and met with Ray Fowler in, I think, August of 67. And then this guy, Roy Craig, went to Malmstrom in October. October of 67 and talked to the base ops officer, base operations, a man by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Chase, and confronted him. He said, do you know anything about, and I've got this on tape, by the way, I've got this on audio tape. <laughs> uh, uh, by the way, well, uh, I'll ask yeah. uh, just as a teaser, don't tell me the answer, but I'm sure that Arrow asked you for this information. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> no, they didn't ask me. Surprisingly, they didn't ask me too many details. But we get into that later. Yeah. Um, so Roy Craig goes to Malmstrom, talks to Lieutenant Colonel Chase, asks him outright, what about these reports that the UFOs were involved in missile shutdowns? <laughs> he was shocked that, he, that Craig even knew about that. But then he said, I can't talk about that. <laughs> Literally, that's what he said. I can't talk about it. And then he claimed he was not privy to that. Well, that's a lot of baloney because of a, um, this gets a little complicated, but on the same evening as my incident, that was March 24th, we had this uh, truck driver headed towards Belt, Montana, which is about 30, 30 or so miles from Great Falls, Montana. And he looks over to his left, he sees this bright white light pacing his truck. Just again, this is a big white light. The light actually again flashed at him. He stops his truck, the light stops, and then descends into a gully just off the side of the road. It was a rather deep gully. <laughs> the truck driver then 
gets the highway patrol to come out there and the highway patrolman together they watch this object rise out of the gully and then fly off and then come back and go back down into the gully obviously the object wanted to be seen mm -hmm. but then they call the air force the air force sends people out there including colonel chase by the way he goes out there he writes a long report about this and but they can't send helicopters in there because uh, for some reason it was too dark at night they wouldn't fly there but because it was down in the gully i guess at any rate the next day the object had disappeared but chase wrote a long report about that not only that but he had the maintenance squadron stand down the maintenance squadron had always been already been alerted about my flight shutting down the entire flight and this was verified by robert jameson one of the supporting mm -hmm. witnesses that i have and jameson said that they were standing down because of this incident at belt the belt incident which was again march 24th and the we reason we know that is because chase wrote a long report to the air force about and sent Condon a copy about the belt incident so Chase would have known that the Oscar flight went down because we had the maintenance people out there ready to go to go back and, and bring the Oscar flight back up on alert. So he lied to the Condon investigator, Craig, told him he didn't know anything about it. And Craig didn't follow up, just left. And so the incident, the Oscar and Echo incidents, never got into the Condon report. And because they didn't get into the Condon report, the Air Force used that excuse of no incident has ever caused a problem or concern with national security. They actually printed that up in their statement. It sounds like accidentally on purpose it didn't make it into that report. Yep, exactly. Okay. Now I have to ask this just for continuity. How were you able to get, because I think this is actually a pretty clever story, or not clever story, but clever what you did here. You are completely allowed to talk about this story. You've been given clearance by the government to talk about this story. How did you now. achieve that? I have now. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> but I... Up until February 15th of this year, I, I didn't have any clearance to talk about this, but I've been talking about it for 30 years almost. Did you and, uh, get I'll threatened? Say, yeah, yeah. When you first brought it, like, tell me about like when you first brought it up and then. I'll, I'll, like, I'll tell you what happened. So I didn't talk about this at all. In 1994, I was in a bookstore in Seattle, Washington, picked up a book called Above Top Secret by Timothy Good. If you get that book and turn to page 301, which I did by accident, it was strictly. Well, I, li I literally have it on my shelf over there. I'm looking at it right okay. now. Well, so 301? Th 301. Page, okay. Turn to page 301, and there's a short paragraph on there about UFOs being involved in the missile, sh missile shutdown at Malmstrom Air Force Base. What it has there is 66, but. I think they were a little confused with that, but they also have 67 a little later. So I thought, my God, Air Force must have declassified this. <laughs> At <laughs> least I was, I was hoping that that's what happened. So very cautiously, I contacted MUFON and got a hold of James Klotz, fantastic investigator. And I asked him to submit a FOIA request, but don't say anything about UFOs. Just ask for information about this incident in 67 at Malmstrom where missiles were disabled for some unknown reason. The Air Force wrote back and said, you know, this is classified, but because it's been so long, we're gonna declassify it and we'll send you documents. And they did. So at that point, since the Air Force declassified ECHO, and I thought I was at ECHO, 
frankly, honestly, I thought that was my incident because of the way it was described. Because I had mm -hmm. forgotten what my commander had said to me about the same thing happening at another flight. He didn't mention the flight name, but I forgotten where I was. I, you know, I because later on I became a commander myself, a uh, crew commander, and I was at November flight. And at times we might have filled in at Echo. It was so confusing by then. I, I would have been 20 some, 27 years had gone by. So I thought I was at Echo Flight. And that's when I went public and said, I was there and UFOs were involved. So I went public with it since the Air Force had declassified the Echo incident. It wasn't until 96 when I finally got a hold of uh, Fred Mywald, my commander. Mm -hmm. He told me we weren't at Echo Flight, we were at Oscar Flight. <laughs> so, at that point, I had to decide whether to keep talking. By then, I, I'd already gone on the, uh, well, let's see, I'd already given interviews. And so I was public by name. And so I decided to continue talking. Even though I knew I was not at Echo, I was at Oscar. Which was a stop. yeah, but you corrected the record, right? As long as you correct the record, yeah, I absolutely corrected the record. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I found out, I was at Oscar flight. Sure. So, the two incidents were very similar. So, like I said, I went all over the world. I've I've been fifteen countries talking about this. Talked all over the U.S. and course, was on the 2001 conference that Greer organized in D.C. And then I did other conferences in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. So he's organizing another one, I think, in the second yeah. week of June yeah, this year. I know. I, know. I, I disassociated myself with Greer a long time ago. He's a little bit too much off the wall. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, there, well, not not to go too much. There's one statement that he's made that makes me scratch my head, and that was that the government, the, the army intelligence or something like that, offered him two billion dollars to be quiet. And it's like, <laughs> army intelligence has access to detachment Delta, right, which can operate within the U.S. They're not going to spend two billion dollars to keep you quiet. They're just going to make you disappear. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not, I'll just leave it at that. I understand. I understand. Yeah. So I've never been hassled by the Air Force or any other government agency really not to talk. And I think the reason is because within a very short time frame, I was able to get not only documents, but other witnesses coming forward to support my case. So they tried to prosecute me under that NDA, I think I could have, you know, I, I would have loudly blown the whistle on the whole thing with supporting documents and people. Yeah. Did you get any menacing phone calls or any harassment of any sort at any time? No. One time, a couple of big gorillas came up and shook my hand like they were going to break my bones in my hand. But other than that, I don't remember any harassment. Tell me more about that. When was that and like what happened? Well, I gave a talk. I think it was in Hollywood. After my talk, you know, I told them the story and they came up and said, thank you for, you know, coming out. And then they wanted to shake hands. And like I said, they were pretty strong guys and I broke the bones in my hand, both of them. And then later, as I was packing up to go home, and I was about the last one to leave this area, and the parking lot was pretty dark, and they were standing by their car looking at me as I walked to my car, and they were just looking, you know. It was almost like they were threatening. What year was this? Oh, gosh. I can't tell you that. It was probably uh, 2005 or four or something like that. And how were they dressed? Well, they both looked like they just changed from their Marine uniforms to uh, civilian 
they were dressed pretty much the same. You know, they were well dressed. Like, uh, so suits? I don't know about suits, but they were cleanly dressed. I, I don't remember. I just don't okay. remember. Hair, hair, like close cropped hair? Or? Close cropped hair, right? They look like Marines. Okay. That's a very specific look, by the way. Yes. It's like a jar, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm trying to think if they're, yeah, I would interest that. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of Marines are funneled into the CIA, but who knows? Okay. That's the only thing right. I felt a little nervous, but other than that, nothing. No. All right. Any other questions that people typically ask you that I didn't that might shed more light on it? Or I feel like I've, you probably feel like I just gave you a proctology exam. <laughs> so the reason that paragraph found its way into above top secret was because Ray Fowler was upset that the Condon investigation investigators didn't include those two incidents, Echo and Oscar, in their final report even though they had that opportunity to do that. So he got angry. And in 1975, I think, or 78, he gave an interview to the Christian Science Monitor and told them what he knew, the fact that th th this was a UFO event. I mean, he got this verified by his own supervisor. The, the Oscar and Echo shutdowns were a UFO event. He had dates, he had names of people they could talk to, etc. And that's how Timothy Good got wind of the incidents and put it in his book. And that's how I was able to read it in 1994. All right, my friend. It was an absolute pleasure hearing about your story and really digging into it. I just wish Arrow asked you the same questions, but we'll find out exactly what questions they asked you in the next episode. Okay. All thank right. Thank you. you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please click on like, subscribe, and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime I post something new.